Well, we're coming to the end of our True Woman 201 study. And over our time together, we've studied those elements that Paul identified as components of godly womanhood. Discernment, honor, family affection, discipline, virtue, responsibility, benevolence, and disposition. Paul told his young pastor friend Titus that these were the essentials for women in his congregation to learn. But it's significant to note that it wasn't Titus's job to mentor women in these essentials. Paul gave women the responsibility to teach and pass on the legacy of godly womanhood from woman to woman, older to younger. Every woman was to be fully engaged in instructing and nurturing other women in the ways of the Lord. Today we're going to talk about how you can join in passing on the legacy of godly womanhood to the next generation. Mary, we're coming to the end of this series and we've looked at some amazing elements. Who knew that in just a few short verses here in Titus 2, Mm -hmm. three verses, there'd be so much to unpack. And what I love about the part we come to today is it takes all of those subjects, those different things we've learned, uh, loving husbands and children, working at home, being self-controlled, not slanderers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it says there's a forward motion from one generation to Mm -hmm. the next, a passing of the baton, and that a true woman is a spiritual mother. Mm -hmm. She's leaving a legacy. And that comes out in this passage where it says that the older women, this is what they're to look like. This is the kind of life they're to have. But then they're supposed to be not only models, they're supposed to be mentors. Exactly. But and what's interesting about this is this this is a letter written to the pastor Titus, and Paul is writing to Titus. But Paul is not is is not telling Titus that he needs to teach all the women. He's saying, make sure that your women are equipped to train the other women. And so there's this motion from, from the truth of God being passed on from generation to generation, not just in general terms, but from woman to woman. And what it means to be a woman is to be taught from woman to woman. And it says older women are to be teachers. Yes. They're to teach what is good and so train the young women. Yeah. Now, that's not always a chronological age thing. No. That, of course, can involve being physically, chronologically older, Mm -hmm. but it may be just more mature in the faith that there's a responsibility not only to live the faith ourselves, but to be sharing it. There have been women at every stage of my life that have had input. And I think of when I was in high school, the lady that was mentoring me, her name was Diane North. And I saw her as an older woman. Now she was just 23 or 24 years old. She was a sounding board for for my ideas and she just really encouraged me right up front to to get into the word of God and to be a student of the word of God and to be conscientious about how I used the word. So I learned a lot from her on how to to conduct a Bible study, how to um, talk to other girls about my faith and she mentored me in, in some aspects of leadership and drawing women in and, and uh, taking them from stage A to stage B to stage C in terms of their growth and discipling them. So I learned a lot from her. Yeah, I've had a number of different women over the years who kind of took me under their wing. A lady I haven't thought about for a long time, but her name was Lita Fisher. She and her husband were an older couple in our church and she would have me over to her house periodically and we would sit and have tea and just over the little kitchenette table there and read scripture together and pray. And she'd want to know how she could pray for me. Mm. And uh, there have been those women who've inspired me, who've, uh, there's been a woman in my life more recently, a pastor's wife, who's just about 10 years older than I am, but she's walked in some places that I haven't. And Mm -hmm. uh, we've been connecting on the phone on a regular Mm -hmm. basis. And she'll ask how she can pray for me. How's it going in specific areas of my life? You told me uh, the other night that that she had asked you, how is your joy doing? Yes, she does. (laughs) She senses a need there in my life and she'll put her finger on it. She's very direct and Uh to the point. And she says, I've been praying for you about this joy thing. How are you doing with that? But then other practical areas of my life. Now, I have to be willing to share with her Mm -hmm. what I'm struggling with, what the issues are. But then she prays about it. She comes back with scripture. She remembers. And the next time we talk, she says, well, we talked about this the last time. I've been praying about that. Mm -hmm. How's it going in this area? Mm -hmm. I've been so 
thankful mm. to have this woman investing in my life, even now that I'm an older woman. I love it. Yeah. I love it. When I get around a, a an older godly woman, a woman who is chronologically older than I am and, and has walked in godliness, I feel like I just want to be a sponge and yeah. like, you know, go Sit right up to her and well, just... Just absorb, right, right. absorb information, ab absorb life wisdom. I, I just love being around those older women. I also love being around younger women. For years, I've said that every woman needs an older woman. Younger women need older women in their lives. Mm. But now as I'm an older woman, I'm realizing how much we need younger women in our lives. These women so, so stimulate my thinking because they're asking questions that, that their culture, what they are facing, some of the issues they are facing are somewhat different than the ones that I faced when I was their age. And yet the truth of God's word is applicable to all generations and all ages and all cultures. So wrestling with, all right, well, what does this look like in your particular culture, yes. cultural pressures that you're facing? And I think it's easy as an older woman to feel a little intimidated mm. by the cool factor and think, I don't have any cool factor. Not, Mary, you're cool. But I think, you know, these, I'm going to be like a fuddy-duddy to mm. these women. And yet it's amazing how if you just love and listen and ask questions, uh, the, the, the hairstyles, the clothing styles, those things really are so insignificant when you get into relationship with these women. And I think of Elizabeth Elliot, who's mm. been a mentor to thousands of women, yes. including to us yes. through her writing and her ministry over the years. And she never made an effort to be cool, but <laughs> she was incredibly popular with college students. Yes. Back when she was speaking a lot. She was a thinker. She, I loved her because she was so thoughtful and because she, she addressed, uh, she used her mind uh, to address scripture and she didn't shy away from hard questions. She was forthright mm -hmm. and she didn't give fluff. She didn't sugarcoat the truth. She just gave it, but you knew that she cared. That's the key, I yeah. think. And that's the key. When I think of the women that impacted my life, in every case, I knew that they cared about me. I think sometimes women are so intimidated by this passage, older women, and they go, well, I'm not a teacher. How can I, you know, I don't want to teach. How do I teach what's good? I have nothing to offer. I have nothing to teach. And the fact is we're all teaching. We're mm -hmm. teaching by our lives. We're teaching by we're example. We're teaching by our words. The question is, are we teaching what is good, as this passage says we're supposed to, mm. or are we teaching what is bad? Yeah. So this, this mentoring, this discipleship, this life-to-life -life investment, we're talking about legacy here, isn't sitting down in a classroom. It's not, you know, opening up your laptop and having a PowerPoint presentation or um, it, it doesn't mean you have a classroom. It can be very life just to life, life very to life. informal yeah. in, the, in the laboratory of life, mm -hmm. in the context of everyday life. And so I think it's easy for a lot of women, maybe even doing a study like this, listening to a conversation like this, to think, oh, Mary and Nancy are teachers. They're doing Titus too. But this passage says to me that all older women, as they mature spiritually, are to be teachers. They are teaching. Mm, they are teaching. Here's what I love about True Woman 101, the stories that I've heard. As, as I've listened to various people report to me what's going on in their churches, what I love hearing and what I hear often is how much uh, it's intergenerational yes. and how this, the, that studying womanhood, there are teenagers and women who are married, women who are single, women who are in midlife, women who are empty nesters, and then even senior citizens and uh, 70, 80, 90 year olds all in the same Come together. group yes. together. Yes. And what a delight that is. Yeah. And the younger ones are loving it. And the older ones are going, oh my goodness, I love this. And, and they're benefiting from one another. And it's interesting as we've talked to younger and older women over the years, I don't know how many times I've heard older women say, these younger women, they don't want to learn. They don't, mm. you know, they're not interested in what I have to offer. And then I hear the younger women say, these older women aren't available. They're not interested in investing in me. And you have this standoff. And I think it's important to say, whether you're younger or older, you take the initiative. Exactly. You reach out. Find a, if you're an older woman, ask God to bring you across the path of a younger woman in your church. It doesn't have to be a formal program. It's just, mm -hmm. could, we, could we just get together? Mm -hmm. Just 
can we have a visit together? And mm -hmm. you don't have to say, have to say this is a lifelong commitment, but to engage, to connect. If you're younger, don't wait for the older woman, woman to come to you. Ask God to show you an older woman in your church who is, you know, her life is worthy of respect and, and say, could I ask you some questions? Mm. Could we get together? And the, the bringing together of these life-to-life -life relationships, multi-generational, can be so powerful. It can be powerful. And I know that in my life, as I've interacted with women who are younger, I've had many women who have come to me and said, Mary, can you disciple me? Can you mentor me? And often I've had to tell them, well, I, I don't have time for doing a sort of, it depends what you mean by that. Yeah. If you mean by that, that you want to hang around and just learn from me, well, sure, come to the hockey rink and we'll watch a hockey game together and talk. And at, that actually happened with one girl. She used to join as me. your son playing hockey, right? It was my son playing yeah. hockey. So, so as I was going and as I was engaged in the life of my family or inviting uh, so them over for dinner, saying, well, it's you know a little bit chaotic around dinner time and you get what you get, but drop in at five and we'll have dinner and you can help me clean the dishes. Right. And, and so that is the context in which the discipleship that I I've seen when I've mentored women, it's happened in that type of context. I think another thing that keeps some older women from really letting down their guard to be engaged this way is feeling like they've blown it, mm. that they haven't succeeded at, you know, maybe their marriage did fail. Mm. Maybe they have shame in their past about not having been pure. They say, I just, I don't have anything to offer because I failed. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we teach out of failure too. Yeah. That I we say, I've needed God's grace. I, I know that in my life, that's the place that I've learned the most is in those hard times, in those times of failure, in those times when I have come to the end of myself and hit a wall and there's nothing but pressing in and, and, and leaning into God and learning from him. And so I agree with you. I think that failure, we can teach, share our failures and say, this is where I'm struggling. This is where I am having a hard time with this. Or, this is how I have had a hard time with yeah. this. This is what I've learned. This is what I wish I wouldn't have done. Yes. To share out of the regrets as well, mm -hmm. uh, because we all have them. We do. I love the definition of mentoring that uh, we talk about in True Woman 201. Simply drawing on your life experience in the context of everyday life to provide encouragement and exhortation to those who are younger. Mm -hmm. That makes mm -hmm. it not so... Not Daunting. so hard. Yeah. Not so hard. Yeah. God has given us all as women this mothering, nurturing instinct, and we ought to be reproducing spiritually life in the life of others. And that happens physically and through physical motherhood, but it also happens spiritually. And the scripture talks about women who have not had physical children. Even though they have not had physical children, they can be the mother of many children. That's been one of the great joys of my life mm -hmm. because God hasn't blessed me with marriage and physical children. But I have people ask me, do you have children? I say, I have adopted children all over the place. And now those kids are having children themselves. You were invited, you were in telling me that. Tonight uh, I'm going to a four-year-old's birthday a party. A four-year-old invited you to yes. her birthday yes. party. She can, wanted yeah, to yeah, can you come to my birthday party? <laughs> so um, yeah, it's um, a joy to have younger people and then as they grow up, their children, to be plugged into those families, to be investing with them. You know, motherhood is something that every woman can and should experience. Exactly. And God isn't ever going to give me physical children, but I am a spiritual mother. Mm -hmm. I've been spiritually mothered. And going back to the first woman, Eve, what does her name mean? Her name means life giver. She's giver of life. And I believe that that is a prototype in a sense for all of us as women that, that God has given us this capacity to, to give life and to nurture life and to, to be a mother hen to someone. I think of uh, one girl that I know, she was infertile. She wasn't able to have children, and it was such a heartache. She wanted them so badly, but year after year, nothing, no, no children. And yet that 
woman used those years and was fruitful, those, those years of barrenness. And she was the volleyball coach. And so she coached her volleyball team and she mentored them and discipled them. And those relationships that she has with those girls are actually, some of them going to be lifelong relationships because she invested in them so much in terms of just mothering them and caring for them. You know, a sign of physical normalcy and health is the capacity to reproduce, mm. the capacity to have children. And I think that's a sign of spiritual maturity, spiritual life, spiritual vitality. If, if, unless something's wrong, you there should, should be, be a capacity to have children. You should be growing, you should be mature, and then you should be spiritually reproducing. And as I get older, I think more about this. Mm. What kind of legacy am I leaving? Yeah. Who am I investing in? If When I'm lying in a box under the ground where my body is, mm. who is going to be carrying that torch and that baton of spiritual motherhood and biblical womanhood. And mm. that isn't going to just happen. We need to be thinking intentionally and consciously about how to pass that baton. We need to consider what is it that we need to teach the younger women. And we have it laid right out here for us in Titus. Right. And these are not things that we need to be rocket scientists in order to unpack them. We just need to share the journey, share the journey of uh, growing in discernment, share the journey of growing in wisdom and in purity and in holiness and in kindness and to share our struggles and journeys with, with the women in our sphere. You know, one of the things I'm finding as I get older and I watch even older women, is there is a tendency, uh, it's easy to fall into the habit of looking at the younger generation and becoming critical. Mm, yeah. You know, yes. they don't have this, they don't have that, they do this, they, they dress do that. Like this, they... And what in the world are they thinking, you know? And uh, I think we need to be careful about that mm -hmm. as older women. Yes, there are issues in their generation and ours, but you know, rather than being critical, what if we rolled up our sleeves and prayed mm. for that younger generation? They need it desperately. We needed it when we were younger. We still need it. And Love invested them. in their lives, loved them. And, Love you know, them. when we see a whole generation of younger women in the church who have this issue and that issue and this, I think we have to ask, do we bear some responsibility for this? Mm. Mm. Have we not modeled to them what a different kind of Christ-centered life looks like? Mm -hmm. Have we failed to train them? Have we failed to obey Titus too? Because if we haven't done this, then we really can't complain mm -hmm. if those coming behind us don't get it. Mm -hmm. And some of these young women are, they're clueless in this. They haven't been mothered. They haven't mm -hmm. been spiritually parented. Yeah. And they just need someone to come and take their hand and encourage them and love on them and pray for them and say, let me, let me encourage you. And I just think that we also need to develop just such a grace to give them grace yeah. for the journey. I just think of where I was at <laughs> 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, and thinking, no, I mean, I was, my life looked a lot different then than it does now. And so to give that grace to go, she is at a different spot and God is working in her life as he was in mine. And just to delight in that journey and to allow um, allow them to ask questions and to disagree and to and wonder to and to fail. Yeah. You know, there's a beautiful passage in Psalm 92. It is an Old Testament passage that give, gives us a challenge about this whole matter of, of legacy. The righteous flourish mm. like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. That's the first key word, flourishing flourishing, growing, planted. But then they're not just flourishing. Listen to what the next verse says. They still bear fruit mm. in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. They're mm. vital. They're alive. They're fruitful to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Mm. You know, there's, there's that, th those two concepts there, flourishing and fruitful. Mm. And I think in our culture, you, you know, young is it. Yep. And a lot of older women, as they get older, feel I'm useless. That's right. And we need to say, no, you should, there should never be a time in your life when you are not flourishing, when you are not growing, and when you are not fruitful. 
That can be true of every season of our lives. I look at my mom who is 87 years old and she is still fruitful. And I, I, and she always says to me, well, I'm still alive today. So there must be something that God has for me to do today. I've asked the Lord to let me serve him with a whole mind, if it would please him until I'm 85. Now, he may not have nearly that long for me. He may have longer. So he sets our times are in his hands. But my heart and yours is that, you know, it, ministry may look different. It will. Yes. Our capacity will change. And the calling God has in our lives will be fleshed out in different ways. But I want to be flourishing mm -hmm. and I want to be fruitful and I want to be leaving something for the next generation yeah. that they can then in turn pass on to those who are coming behind them. So Mary, lead us if you would in that prayer. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for your plan of passing on truth from generation to generation. It astonishes me sometimes that you pass on your truth through such broken vessels mm -hmm. and that you pass on truth through human instruments yes. and that you desire me to speak truth to someone and that she speak truth to someone else and she pass that truth on to someone else. So, Father, I pray that we may be faithful. Mm -hmm. We may be faithful in passing on a legacy. We may be faithful in being in flourishing in the Word of God and the ways of the Lord, but also in being fruitful in just pouring ourselves into the lives of others and just loving them mm -hmm. and uh, speaking forth the faithfulness of God from generation to generation. Yes. In the name of Jesus, amen.